Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Today we're going to finish up our look on tides and see how things such as uh, the topography of the ocean floor, currents, Coriolis, and land masses affect tides in the real world. So let's cue up the music and finish this up. Now what you'll notice with this is that there are places where the tidal amplitude is very, very low. It's actually zero. And those are the places here in pink. In these places, there is no tide. Well, what Zetetic Flat Earth is talking about now is something called tidal nodes or amphidromic points, where the tides are especially low compared to the surrounding areas. Now, we'll go over those in a couple of minutes, but just to let you know, the information that's being put out is simply not correct. For example, this is an amphidromic point centered on the Hawaiian Islands off the western coast of the United States. Honolulu, Hawaii clearly has tides. So it's not that these points are zero tide, it's that they are lower tides than the surrounding areas, and then we'll talk about why that is. And these are the places, these points, that there is no tide literally no tide at all, and there's tons of them all over this map. There's these ones in the center of the oceans, which are quite easy to see, but if you look closely at this map of amphidromic points, tidal nodes, you'll see there's also a number of much smaller ones that operate in smaller regions. I'm gonna circle these three. Look, there's three tidal nodes. These are areas, again, with no tide, where the water is still. Now if you look up amphidromic points in Wiki, you will see that they are the center of rotation of tides due to currents coming, coming into contact with each other and setting up a whirlpool type effect which may extend over hundreds of square miles. And they are due to the topography of the bottom of the ocean, ocean currents, and in some cases land masses as they go through. We'll see that in a minute. But let's look at these guys out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean first. Imagine, if you would, a large area where two currents that are at opposing directions come into contact with each other. Those currents will begin to rotate as they pass, very much like um, a whirlpool would occur where you have two opposing currents coming into contact in a river. Now, there are two things that make these currents rotate. One is the Coriolis effect due to the rotation of the Earth. The other is the strength of the currents, which is determined by temperature, salinity, and topography of the ocean floor. Now, all other factors being equal, they will rotate counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere and clockwise in the southern hemisphere. However, you may get a situation where the currents are strong enough to overcome the Coriolis effect and make them rotate in the opposite direction. So, if you look at a rotating mass of water, what happens to the center of that mass? It dips down a little bit and becomes very stable. You can, you can simulate this by just stirring a pot of soup on the stove. The center of the, of the whirlpool will dip down and not move very much as centrifugal force causes the water to creep up the sides of the pot in response to the rotating motion. Now, simply because the center is relatively stable and low to begin with, you're not seeing much in the line of a tidal fluctuation at the center of that rotation, such as the Hawaiian Islands. Let's go ahead and have a look at some other examples. This is a better chart of the polar sea. So this is, again, a North Polar projection. I've placed a big X on the North Pole, and you can see even more in here it seems almost like there's too many to count like there's areas where they're just extremely dense these tidal nodes and of course from our discussion of how the tidal bulges are formed by the moon on the earth that water came from the poles so it would follow that at the polar regions tides would be very 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 shallow because most of the action is occurring down between 29 degrees north and 29 degrees south under the path of the moon. Uh, but first, this is the Mediterranean. There's also tidal nodes in the Mediterranean. It's not as dense, maybe, as in the Polar Sea. This is another one that's on land, actually. And I think it looks like there's one here. You can see this is Cyprus, so that's sort of how the 
Mediterranean here is aligned. Now, if you look at the actual wiki page on these tidal nodes, it talks about them being present in the polar seas. Now, where else does it suggest that they'll be present? How about in shallow landlocked seas, such as the Mediterranean and the Black Sea? And here we see the Mediterranean has several of them. But one thing I want to draw your attention to, have a look at that bay down there with the red in it. Why would a bay have such high tides in an area that's got relatively low tides? This is the North Sea near uh, the United Kingdom, and you can see these two tidal nodes here, as well as a tidal node with Dave clearly marked on Sweden or Norway. That would be in Norway. I've also got this side by side with an actual animation. You now, what's nice about this animation, it shows tides. It doesn't just show tidal amplitude. It shows tides in real time. And you can see how high these tides are relatively. These are, these are these huge two or three meter tides that are all rushing up through this English channel here. And yet you do have a tidal node very close into here. So you've got these massive tides, but you actually have a tidal node around here. Now this model doesn't show the tidal nodes amazing because you can see some of the tide go in through here. But it's pretty good here where you can see the tides up on this side, then it's up on this side. It's up on this side, and then it's up on this side. And the tidal node itself, the sea level never changes. Now this is an interesting illustration that he's using. He's just not understanding what it shows very well. As the tides go around the British Isles, they're constricted through the English Channel. So you have a huge volume of water coming up against the landmass of the British Isles, and it's being squeezed through this very narrow English Channel. It would follow that as it came out the other end, there may be some eddies and swirling, just like you would see um, uh, water go around a rock in a brook. You'll see swirling as it reaches the far side of that rock. That's what tidal nodes come from, is this rotating current. So this actually confirms what we're talking about here. Now, if you look a little closer over here between, say, Ireland and the British Isles out here, you'll see that those sea passages are relatively short compared to the length of the British Isles, and you're not getting a whole lot of flow through that area. So you'll have tides in here, of course, but you're not going to have the eddy currents that you see over here in southeast England. To give you an idea of how this works, let's go ahead and have a look at this video of people surfing a tidal bore in the United Kingdom. Notice that when you look at this, you'll see that it's not a solid wall of water coming through. There are eddies, especially as it gets up by the shore and as it makes turns around bends in the river. This is very analogous to what happens when the tidal, bore, the tidal bore or the tides come through the English Channel and form a tidal node on the southeast corner of the island. So this is a better map, a more um, detailed map of the tidal nodes, and it shows another tidal node with this arrow around New Zealand. So New Zealand's another example of a tidal node that's not under the ocean, but still seems to affect the tides. Dude, tidal nodes are in the water. They're not on land, period. And what I mean by affect the tides, as you can see this arrow, tides revolve around tidal nodes. So a high tide seems to be a bulge of water that will revolve in a certain direction, and it looks like the direction is different, in these different nodes. There's clockwise and there's anti-clockwise, but it has nothing to do with the equator because this one you can see here is clockwise. This one you can see is counterclockwise. Uh, this one you can see is also clockwise. And this one here is counterclockwise. And there's really no pattern to whether it's going to be clockwise or counterclockwise. Okay, once again, he seems to be letting his flat earth non-rotating Earth narrative dictate his interpretation of what these tidal nodes actually represent. Now, if they were areas of low pressure in the atmosphere and nothing else affected them, such as land masses, etc., you would expect them to rotate as Coriolis would dictate. However, if the tidal nodes are indeed caused by currents 
and eddies as they move through constrictions of land such as the English Channel, the currents would form the tidal note, not the other way around. And I think that's what we're seeing here. This shows a live animation of the tides, and you can see exactly what I mean when I say that tides revolve around the nodes. So I told you about those two nodes up here in Hudson's Bay. You can see the high tide in red revolving around the coast of Hudson's Bay. You can also see this in uh, New Zealand, which I told you was an onland tidal node. You can see this high tide in red spinning around New Zealand and the low tide in blue, so negative tide, also spinning around New Zealand and they almost look like magnetic fields. You know, he almost seems to get it there. He recognizes that the tides are, are shearing past each other. And then he starts going off the rails into this magnetic field thing, um, which seems to have come out of left field. But we'll let him continue. Now let's have a look at his animation of the tides again. Now I want you to pay special attention to the southern tip of South America and the Drake Passage between South America and the Antarctic Peninsula. Notice how high tide goes right through there and swirls around. Then low tide goes right through there and swirls around, followed by high tide again. You see how the eddy formation occurs on the southeast coast of South America? Now look at the land masses in there. Notice how it kind of hooks from the north down to the southeast and traps all of that tidal surge in there. So that's an ideal place for an eddy. Why don't you go down to a stream and put, put a piece of wood in the, in the stream and see what happens around the tip of the wood on the downstream side. That's what you're seeing in South America. And finally, let's have a look at the actual Bay of Fundy. There it is. Notice as the tide comes up the mouth of the bay, it goes off into those, those two arms down there and is just funneled right in. It absolutely follows that you would have enormous tides at the end of that bay. And that's what we see. If we go back to this earlier map, you can see that there are all those tidal nodes there at the base of South America, just like you may expect if these tidal nodes were what's creating these tides because you've got a high density of these tides. So you're actually moving a great deal of water against this continent of South America, which is why you've got this black here. This is, I don't know how tall the tidal amplitude is right here, but it's very, very high. I think in some places the amplitude is as much as four meters. Frankly, laughable that people can think after looking at tidal nodes and how tides react around tidal nodes that the moon is doing this. You've got it's this joke of an animation here on the bottom right that that corresponds, does not correspond whatsoever with the models I've shown you. But it does do a pretty good job explaining how we get neap and spring tides, doesn't it? As well as this one on the top where you have a bulge both on the moon side and on the non-moon side and nothing on the top or bottom. Even though we know that there's a great deal of tide in the southern part and in the northern part of what would be this map here. But based on what we learned in the first two videos, we can easily explain that, can't we? It makes perfect sense. What got me into looking at this was taking a trip to Hawaii. I'm from Vancouver. This is a picture on the right of a Vancouver tide. And I went to Hawaii expecting tides to behave similarly as they would in Vancouver. I think most people just assume tides are the same everywhere. So let's see if we can kind of suss this out based on what we know. So the Hawaiian islands are volcanic islands. They are, have very steep sides and a very deep ocean all the way around them. Uh, and they're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. What kind of tides would you expect there? Now contrast that with Vancouver, British Columbia, which is on the North American mainland, between the mainland and an island, I should say. And there's a continental shelf where the seafloor gets very shallow rather quickly and the tides really don't have a whole lot of places to go. So, which do you think would have the bigger tides? My bet's on the island of Vancouver, British Columbia. 
I have a few speculations about what tidal notes are. They could be a sea life living deep under the water that's affecting the water, the movement of the water somehow. I've put in the background my favorite sea life, which is the kraken. It's also the it's it's a fantasy sea life um, because it's so giant. Nothing that giant exists that we know of. The kraken. Seriously. All right, sea life causing these tidal nodes. Are you suggesting that somehow? Trillions of plankton are all getting together and flapping their little fins at the same time to kind of study the sea. And they do that every six hours. That makes a lot of sense, Chief. Uh, or plate boundaries. It could just be where tectonic plates collide and where they're moving against each other. The same thing that causes volcanoes, seems to cause volcanoes and earthquakes, could also be causing the tides. Well, you realize that tectonic plates only go with a globe Earth, right? So by even citing tectonic plates, you're admitting that the Earth is a sphere. But that, that aside, so you're suggesting that the tectonic plates move on a six-hour time schedule, day in and day out? Do volcanoes erupt every six hours? Do we have earthquakes in the same spot every six hours? Do you think any of these things through it all? And the third speculation is not my speculation, but it's the speculation that everybody accepts, and that's that the moon is causing the tides. And for everybody, for this to be the consensus, the scientific consensus is extremely embarrassing. Well, you may be embarrassed that the rest of the world understands that the moon controls the tides. You know, except of course for you and a few other awoke people in the flat earth. Yet, our model completely explains the tides. It completely explains tidal nodes. It completely explains why the Bay of Fundy has such high tides. You, on the other hand, have the Kraken and Plankton and plate tectonics, which you'll use for this particular example. But when we point that out as a globe proof, you'll deny they exist. So, I think we're pretty comfortable with the moon being the cause of the tides. Well, guys, understanding the tides completely requires a couple of semesters of oceanography and then a lifetime of study. So in a 15 minute video, I think I gave you some of the basics. Uh, if you're further interested, uh, there's NOAA, there's a number of other websites that you can go to to get more detailed information. Or audit a course, listen to a TED talk about it. In any event, I'm pretty sure it's caused by the moon rather than the Kraken. So I'm going to kind of stick with that. So this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Make sure you hit that little like and subscribe button down there. I'd like to get some more subscribers for this channel. And also we have a Patreon and a website in case you want to have a look at those. We'll see you again soon and thank you for stopping by.